Hello, students. Hello, and welcome to uh, class today. I'm Richard Nesta. Today, we're going to take a, a break a bit from chemistry and learn about biology. And um, my main focus today is going to be to take you through digestion, which is a very critical aspect of the topic of nutrition, one of the most fundamental topics of, um, of biology that is very important for you to must and understand. So welcome, stay with me as I'm going to navigate with you through this very important section. If I can take you briefly through the background on nutrition, by now you must have learned about uh, the modes of nutrition, the fact that we have two main modes of nutrition, autotrophism, the mode of nutrition where living things manufacture their own food, from simpler substances in the environment and um, heterotrophism, which is of course a mode of nutrition where living things depend on already manufactured food materials. And um, when you are looking at the various modes of uh, heterotrophism, you must have learned about holozoic nutrition, which is a mode of nutrition where living things um, take in complex food materials. Um, and uh, when you talk about complex food materials, you're talking about uh, the various chemicals of life, which you talked about. These ones are the carbohydrates, the proteins, and the lipids. And um, for these organisms to be able to take in the complex food materials, the complex food materials cannot be utilized in the body in the form in which they are taken. They must be converted, they must be broken down into uh, soluble and simpler forms which can be taken into the body and be incorporated into cellular metabolism and be used in various processes which are very very important to the body. So in a nutshell we need to remember that human nutrition basically occurs in um, about four main stages. There is ingestion, there is digestion, there is absorption, of the digested food materials into the bloodstream. Then of course, what follows next is um, assimilation. And finally, we have ejection. So our focus for today is going to be on the second stage of human nutrition, and that is going to be on digestion. So what is it that takes place during digestion of food materials in our bodies? And uh, there is, the requisite knowledge that is important for you to know, even as we go through this uh, session for today, for you to adequately understand the subtopic of digestion, it is very critical that you have a solid background understanding of the chemicals of life, that is the proteins, the carbohydrates, the lipids. And the focus here is you need to be able to know the properties of these uh, chemicals of life, the various types, uh, particularly for carbohydrates. This is where we have main issues. Remember, uh, we have three different classes of carbohydrates, the monosaccharides, the disaccharides, and uh, the polysaccharides. The knowledge, the knowledge of these types of uh, carbohydrates and uh, their properties becomes very, very critical in understanding the concept of digestion very effectively. At the same time, the concept of enzymes, what are enzymes? What are their properties? And what are the factors which affect the activity of the enzymes? Because digestion is a process which is largely being achieved through the activity of the enzymes. So if you're not going to be able to understand the factors affecting the enzymes, if you're not able to, go to understand the properties of the enzymes, it becomes a, a challenge for you to have a, a, a mastery and a solid grasp of the aspect of uh, digestion. And remember our focus at uh, top noise recreations, as you have always learned uh, in chemistry, is that our focus as top notch educators is always to guide you and ensure that you know what is always expected of you as a candidate. The focus is that as a candidate, there is need for you to always know what is it that is always tested? How is it always tested? And what is it that is always expected of you as a candidate who is preparing for 
exams. Remember our focus also here is to guide you through these concepts and to highlight the very common mistakes that candidates usually make when it comes to tackling national examinations. Remember, if you are a keen student of biology, you will understand that of late there has been a very poor performance in biology and um, there is need for you to understand, uh, for us as the present candidates or the present biology student, there's need for you to understand and know what are these common mistakes that students have been making that is denying them the chance to get the top sterling grades. And as a current candidate, knowing these mistakes is very, very critical for you in ensuring that you prepare and the efforts you place in your studies can be optimized to give you uh, the greatest uh, chance at success. So your focus through this session should be you knowing what is the meaning of digestion, you knowing the types of digestion or the forms of digestion, and you knowing how digestion takes place in the mouth, the digestive processes taking place in the stomach, the digestive processes taking place in the duodenum, and the digestive processes taking place in the ileum. This is very, very important for you to understand. So in a nutshell, what do we mean by digestion? Digestion is the process through which complex food materials are broken down physically and chemically into simpler soluble substances that can be absorbed by the body cells. We have just said that we have uh, three main chemicals, uh, three main groups of chemicals of life, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the lipids. And these chemicals of life, they are required by our bodies. But if you can recall in the topic of the cell, when you're looking at the cell, and one of the important structures in the cell was the cell membrane. And if you recall closely, we said the cell membrane is semi-permeable. It is selectively permeable, meaning it only allows the small-sized molecules to pass across, while it does, uh, it, it does not allow the large-sized molecules to pass across. So most of the food substances that we take in are always large in size. And being that they are large, they cannot easily pass across the cell membrane. So this means that the complex proteins we take in, the complex lipids we take in, the complex carbohydrates that we take in, when we take them in, they are too large to be taken in by the cells. So as a result of this, they have to be broken down into simpler forms which can be taken in by the cells. And this breakdown usually occurs physically and it occurs chemically as we are going to see in a short while. And remember in biology questions of digestion, or rather questions of definition, a candidate has to be as exact as possible. So that is why it's always very important to pay attention to the details of uh, these uh, definitions. So definition of digestion needs to, 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 to highlight the fact that it is a physical process and it is also a chemical process. And from that definition, you also get the essence of digestion, the significance of digestion, which is to break down complex food materials into smaller soluble substances which can be taken in by the cells. But it's also, it's also important for us to take note of the fact that not all molecules, not all food molecules are always um, digested. There are some food molecules which we take in and already they are in the simplest state which the body cells can easily just take in. For example, uh, vitamins, mineral salts, water, and even glucose, these ones are substances which are already in their simplest forms. So the, there's no need for uh, digestion of these substances. Because what is the essence of digestion? So that these substances are converted into a simpler form that our body's cells can take in. But now these molecules, they're already in the simplest form. So they can, they're always just absorbed directly. They can easily be taken up by the cells 
for various metabolic reactions in the body. So it's always important to highlight that. And um, at the same time, remember, digestion can be either mechanical or it can be chemical. Mechanical digestion is, is also what we refer to as uh, physical digestion. And this basically involves the breakdown of the large molecules into smaller molecules without changing the chemical nature of the food. And this one is largely achieved through the action of the teeth in the mouth and also through the action of uh, the muscles which make up the alimentary canal. And then we have chemical digestion. Chemical digestion involves the conversion of the large food molecules into simpler, chemically different food molecules. And this is often carried out by either acids or enzymes that we have um, at various stages of, uh, at various parts of the digestive system. So it's always significant for us as candidates to be able to know uh, the difference between the two. And uh, this illustration that I'm projecting on your screen right now brings out this difference uh, quite clearly. And I would like us to observe this. This one is a sucrose molecule, and this one is an illustration of the cell. If you look at this, you realize that this large sucrose molecule, it is too large to be taken in by the cell. So physical or mechanical digestion will take place. So it is uh, broken down into smaller sucrose molecules by the action of the teeth. And once this happens, we have smaller sucrose molecules, yes. But still, they are too large to be taken in by the cell. So what this implies is there is still need for us to have uh, the sucrose molecules broken down into smaller molecules which can be taken in by the cells. So this is now where the enzymes come into play because however much you break down sucrose into smaller particles, the sucrose molecules are still, even if you have to break them to individual single sucrose molecules, a single sucrose molecule is too large to be taken in by the cells. So the sucrose molecules are further broken down by enzymes to give us uh, glucose and fructose. Remember, sucrose is a disaccharide. Sucrose is a disaccharide. And uh, a disaccharide, when hydrolyzed or when broken down uh, into the constituent monosaccharides, it gives us one molecule of glucose and one molecule of uh, fructose. So glucose and fructose are monosaccharides, and these ones now, are very much simpler. So they can easily be taken in by the cells for various metabolic reactions. So if we are having a large sucrose molecule and we break it down into smaller sucrose molecules, we are simply just breaking uh, the large sucrose molecule into smaller sucrose molecules. We are breaking sucrose into sucrose. The, the only difference is the size. We are breaking a larger sucrose molecule into smaller sucrose molecules. So this is physical digestion. There is no change in the chemical structure or the chemical nature of the food substance. When you take in a lump sum piece of ugali and you break it down uh, by the grinding action of the teeth, However much you break it down, ugali is largely made up of starch. However much you break it down by the grinding action of the teeth, you still just get smaller molecules of starch. So that is physical or mechanical digestion. Then now, we, those simpler molecules of starch, the body cells can still not take them in. They, can, they can't be taken in by the cells. So you have to break them down into smaller molecules. So for starch, starch has to be broken down to, uh, it has to be broken down to maltose, and then the maltose is further broken down to glucose. So what will break down starch to maltose, and the maltose to, uh, maltose to glucose is the enzymes, which are very essential in the process of digestion. So it's always very important for us to understand the difference between uh, chemical digestion and uh, 
uh, physical digestion uh, processes. So this is just a simple illustration that is showing what enzymes are doing. They are simply they have the ability to cut down the large sized food molecules into smaller sized food molecules of different chemical nature. So what is the essence of digestion? Once again, it's also important for us to, for you to note that all carbohydrates must be broken down into the simplest form. And the simplest form of carbohydrates are the monosaccharides. So we have the three classes of carbohydrates. Monosaccharides are the simplest form. The main examples of, examples of monosaccharides we have learned are glucose, fructose, and galactose. These ones, when taken in uh, during feeding, they will not be digested in any way because they're already in the simplest form. But for the disaccharides, disaccharides, they have to be digested. They have to be broken down to monosaccharides. So for example, lactose must be broken down to galactose and uh, glucose. If it is sucrose, sucrose has to be broken down to fructose and glucose. If it is maltose, which is the other uh, disaccharide, it, has so, it also has to be broken down to glucose. So all carbohydrates must always be broken down into the simplest form, the monosaccharides, which can be taken in by the body cells. All proteins must also be broken down to amino acids. Remember, if you can recall from uh, chemicals of life, proteins are usually synthesized from condensation of several amino acids. A single protein chain is made up of several amino acids linked together, and that makes it co too complex to be taken in by the cells. So if you take in proteins, the proteins must be broken down into the amino acids, which can be taken in by the body cells. All lipids must also be broken down to fatty acids and glycerol. So if you're talking about digestion, these are the processes that must take place uh, during digestion. It's always very essential because this enables you to know when digestion is completed in the body. And still also the anatomy of the digestive system is very, very important. The anatomy of the digestive system is very, very important for you to understand. The digestive system, which is also known as the alimentary canal, begins from the mouth cavity and it ends in the anus when the undigested and indigestible food materials are uh, released from the body. Now, what is it that is important here? What is important for a candidate is to be able to know the anatomy of the digestive system. Being able to identify the various organs of the digestive system is a critical skill that as a candidate, it's very important for you to possess. You can be given an illustration of the digestive system and, the, and uh, the various parts are indicated with unknown letters and then you'll be asked to identify these parts. It's also important for you to know the digestive processes taking place at every stage, every part of the digestive system. Because sometimes a question can simply be asked, label on the diagram or label on the photograph, the part where amylase is secreted. Label on the diagram a part where protein digestion takes place. Label on the diagram the part where digestion is completed in the body. This becomes very important. And so the knowledge of the digestive system is very, very critical, very, very essential. And um, when you are asked to identify these parts, when you are asked to identify these parts, it's always important to note the following. One, questions of identity in biology, your spelling has to be absolute. Even if you miss your spelling by a single letter, it can cost you, it can cost you marks. But apart from that one, we always advise candidates that it is very important to always give identities and desist from using the descriptive names where possible. For example, uh, 
normalize the use of the name ileum instead of small intestine normalize the use of the name colon instead of large intestine large intestine and uh, small intestine these ones are descriptive terms which we always advise students to try as much as possible to minimize because you see anatom an anatomically the moment you talk about small intestine even duodenum is part of the small intestine but we know that the, that the digestive processes taking place in the duodenum are different from the digestive processes taking place in the ileum but both of them are parts of the small intestine so it's always essential for you to desist from the usage of these descriptive names. Now, we have said, if I can trace the path of the digestive system, it starts from the mouth, it goes to the stomach via the oesophagus or the gullet. Then from the stomach, we move into the duodenum. Then from the duodenum, we go to the ileum. From the ileum, we go to the colon. Now, take note of the following. Digestion starts in the mouth and digestion ends in the ileum. We also have accessory organs, organs which are also associated with the digestive system, but play critical roles in digestion process, even though uh, they also play other processes, but they're also very essential in the process of digestion process. And these ones, the main ones are the liver, and uh, the pancreas, these two organs play uh, critical roles in, in digestion. And I've always seen a very common mis uh, mistake with the learners when they are asked to identify pancreas and the right pancreas with an E at, uh, at the end. Always be very keen with um, the spellings of uh, uh, the key terms that we have in biology and as i have said when asked to identify various parts of the digestive system misspellings become highly uh, penalized it's always important to take that into consideration so we have said digestion takes place in the mouth and it ends in the ileum so your focus as a candidate is supposed to be you knowing what are the digestive processes taking place in the mouth what are the digestive processes taking place in the stomach? What are the digestive processes taking place in the duodenum? And what are the digestive processes taking place in the ileum, the final point of digestion? These are very, very critical um, factors you need to know about the digestive process. Uh, in the mouth also we have the three salivary glands that are important for you to note. We are going to look into that shortly when you're discussing digestion in the mouth. Um, I'll just mention something also briefly at this point in time. We, I, I, I highlighted at the beginning that the knowledge of the factors affecting activity of enzymes is very critical in understanding the process of digestion. Like one of the main factors affecting the process of uh, the activity of enzymes is always pH. Take note that in all these four basic parts where digestion takes place, that is in the mouth, the stomach, the duodenum, and the ileum, in all these parts, the pH is always alkaline, with the exception of the stomach, where the pH is always acidic due to secretion of the hydrochloric acid. So in a nutshell, students, what takes place in the mouth. Let's look at digestion in the mouth. In the mouth, there are two aspects of digestion taking place, and that is both physical, both chemical and physical digestion usually occurs in the mouth. And digestion usually begins with ingestion. When you talk about ingestion, you're talking about introduction of food in the mouth. So digestion starts with the ingestion. Food is introduced in, um, in the mouth, and then it will be grounded by the chewing action of the, of the teeth. The chewing action of the teeth is also known as mastication, and this chewing action breaks the food molecules 
into smaller particles. And what is the significance of this? This is to increase the surface area for enzymatic action. This ensures that a larger surface area of the food is exposed to enzymes for increased enzymatic activity, and this ensures faster digestion of food occurs. And this one, students, is a perfect example of physical digestion. Okay, then of course, at the same time, the food will be mixed with saliva, and this saliva comes from three main salivary glands, uh, the parotid gland, the sublingual gland, and the submandibular gland. These ones are the main three, the three main glands which produce um, saliva. Now, the saliva usually contains a number of substances which are essential for us to know. One, it contains saliva ramulase, which is an enzyme. Uh, it's also referred to as tyaline. If you can recall when we were uh, uh, discussing the naming of enzymes, we have the trivial naming, and you also have naming based on the kind of food substrate that the enzyme is acting on. Starch is also called amylose. And so the enzyme amylase is an enzyme which acts on amylose, which is starch. So the saliva contains salivary amylase, and the salivary amylase digests starch in the mouth into maltose. So this one is chemical digestion because we are seeing the starch being digested, being converted into a different, into a chemically different substance. The starch is being broken down to maltose. So this one is an aspect of chemical digestion. At the same time, the saliva contains mucus to lubricate, to lubricate the food, and it's also alkaline to provide a suitable medium, pH, suitable pH medium for activity of the enzyme salivary amylase. Salivary amylase is an enzyme which, digest, which uh, works optimally, works best at a pH that is slightly alkaline. And how is this alkaline activity, uh, alkaline pH medium achieved in the mouth. It is achieved through the secretion of the saliva, which is slightly alkaline. And also in, in the saliva, we also have um, we also have some chloride ions, which are essential cofactors in the activity of the enzyme uh, salivary amylase. It is important to take this into consideration. At the same time, also within the saliva, we also have another enzyme we're calling the lysozyme enzyme, which is essential in digesting or breaking down the cell walls of uh, any bacteria that could have been ingested by the food. At this particular point, what is essential here is for you to know the components of the saliva. It's essential for you to know the three salivary glands from where saliva is uh, secreted from. Because sometimes an exa we, in exams, you can be asked to state the three roles of saliva in digestion. And stating the three roles of the saliva, it will be important for you to note the, the components, the components of the saliva. And by noting the components of the saliva, it will be easier for you to now relate that to the functions of the saliva. Note that the saliva also contains mucus, and that it's that mucus that it gives the, the saliva the ability uh, or the, the, the lubrication uh, property, ensuring that now the, saliva, uh, the food is lubricated so as to move uh, smoothly along the, uh, the digestive system. At the same time, the, the, the tongue also plays a critical role in digestion in the, in, the, in, the, in the mouth. What does it do? The tongue rolls the food into boluses uh, that will be pushed to the back of the mouth for swallowing. That rolling of the food into boluses is usually achieved through the action of the tongue. But the tongue also plays a critical role in mixing, mixing the food with the saliva. Remember the food needs to be mixed well with the saliva so that the food comes into contact with the saliva amylase to digest the starch that is present in the food. 
So in a nutshell, what are the main digestive processes taking place in the mouth? One, in the mouth there is physical digestion. The food that is ingested is mechanically broken down by the grinding action of the teeth. We call this process mastication. What is the significance of mastication? Mastication increases the surface area or activity of the enzymes. That is one. Two, the other dominant digestive process taking place in the mouth is digestion of starch. When food is ingested, there will be secretion of saliva. The saliva contains saliva amylase, which digests starch that is present in the food into maltose. This one is an aspect of chemical um, digestion. Remember, digestion of proteins does not uh, chemical digestion of proteins, chemical digestion of lipids does not take place in the mouth. In, uh, but there is physical digestion of all the classes of food. It is essential for you to know what are the components of mucus. It is important for you to know what are the, what are the components of saliva and what are the functions of the saliva in the process of digestion. These are very critical questions for you to be able to note. And uh, it's also important to take into consideration the fact that digestion of starch by salivary amylase requires an alkaline medium, which is provided by the saliva. So the two main processes taking place in, two main digestive processes taking place in the mouth are physical digestion and also chemical digestion of uh, starch. These are these ones are essential question uh, questions that you need to be able to to understand. This is just an illustration that is showing the significance of mastication in terms of uh, increasing the surface area for the enzymatic activity. If you if if the food was to be one large square as you see here, then the Square the total surface area that will be in contact with saliva and read it as the surface area in contact with saliva amylase will be 24 square units. But if we break this into smaller, smaller square blocks, then now the total surface area, like as um, represented in this case, will be 96 square units being in contact with saliva amylase. So this basically means that breaking down the food molecules into smaller particles increases surface area for activity of the enzyme salivary amylase and even the activity of the other enzymes that are still going to interact with the food in the other parts of the digestive system. Now, once the food has been chewed, and rolled into boluses. Uh, that is some smaller rounded uh, masses of food. It will be pushed into the back of the mouth where it is swallowed. And uh, once swallowing takes place, the food will the, the boluses will be pushed into the into the esophagus, where the boluses are moved into the stomach through a process we are referring to as peristalsis. And uh, peristalsis is one of the most misspelled words in the topic of, nut uh, of nutrition, which is very important for us to students to take note of. Uh, normalize writing this word correctly, and some practice can go a long way in mastering that. So peristalsis, the rhythmic contractions and the relaxations of the muscles of the esophagus that creates a squeezing action on the boluses, pushing them along the esophagus into the stomach. And uh, while students tend to think that peristalsis occurs in the esophagus only, note that peristalsis occurs in the esophagus and it even occurs in the other parts of the digestive system, along ileum, along colon, Peristalsis occurs in all these areas. And uh, to illustrate further, the esophagus is always made up of two sets of muscles. We have circular muscles and we have longitudinal muscles. 
So these muscles, they contract and relax, uh, but they do this one um, antagonistically. If one set contracts, the other one relaxes. So like in this particular case here, if the muscles at this point, if the circular muscles at this point were to contract, then they will constrict, they will narrow the diameter of the esophagus at this particular point. This one creates a squeezing action at this particular point, which pushes the bolus downwards into the new position. At this particular point, the longitudinal muscles at this part, they relax. Then once the food, once the bolus has been pushed to the new point, uh, the, circular the circular muscles at this point, they contract again, while the longitudinal muscles at this point relax. And when that happens, the bolus will be pushed again into a lower level. So this rhythmic contract, this series of involuntary uh, contractions and relaxations of these sets of muscles that pushes the food down into the stomach is what we are referring to as peristalsis. We are saying it is involuntary. Why are we saying it is involuntary? Movements and processes that occur in our bodies, they can either be involuntary or voluntary. They are voluntary if they occur by will, if you decide as a person to do it, but they are involuntary if they occur without your will. Now, even if you have just taken food right now, you are not going to, you don't decide, you don't decide for your circular muscles and longitudinal muscles of your esophagus, you don't decide for them to contract or relax. But like right now, the way you can, if, if I decide to stand at, from, from this place and walk around using, I'll, 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 be, I'll be using my skeletal muscles. And that will be something that is voluntary. If you decide, if you lift your hand right now, it will be voluntary. You, have, you are doing it at will. But the peristaltic movement is something that does not occur by the will of mammals or by the will of animals. So this, that's why we are saying it is involuntary. So this is, uh, these are very, very important concepts to, to understand. This is a further illustration of the peristalsis process that we have just uh, talked about. Have you ever wondered that during swallowing, you can't breathe? And this explain way, explains why sometimes if you are eating and uh, you are choked with food, if food gets stuck um, with the farings, then it can end up choking you and leading to death as a result of suffocation. So during swallowing, two things happen that make uh, breathing uh, during swallowing impossible. When boluses are being pushed down uh, the pharynx, we have this soft palate. The soft palate rises, and when it rises, it blocks the nasal cavity. At the same time, the boluses, when they move downwards, they press the epiglottis downwards. And when the epiglottis is, uh, is pressed downwards, it covers the trachea or the windpipe. And when that happens, it means it, uh, breathing becomes impossible um, during swallowing. And this explains why choking can be very, very dangerous during swallowing. So students, as you come to the end of digestion in the mouth, what are the important review questions you need to ask yourself? As a, as a student right now, you need to ask yourself, am I able to define what digestion is? Am I able to describe the two aspects of digestion, the physical digestion and the chemical digestion? As a student, am I able to state the three roles of saliva? Take note of that one, saliva, not mucus. It's also important for you to ask yourself as a student, am I able to know the significance of mastication? What is mastication? And what is the significance of mastication? Am I able to identify the three components of saliva, not mucus? And am I able to state the three salivary glands that produce saliva into the mouth cavity? And also, am I able to describe the digestive process taking place in the mouth? We have said we have two main 
digestive processes there. Physical digestion of all the food substances, but only chemical digestion of carbohydrates, which specifically is starch taking place there. So with that now, I would like us to wind our session by looking, wind of our session, by looking at digestion in the, in the stomach. So the boluses arrive in the stomach. Now, what happens in the stomach next? So arrival of food in the stomach usually stimulates secretion of a hormone we are calling gastrin hormone. Once again, I wish to highlight it again. It's a very common misspelling of the name gastrin. We have a common case where students like writing uh, gastrin with an E at the end. This one should be avoided. So when food arrives in the stomach, there will be secretion of gastrin hormone. Then the gastrin hormone will in turn stimulate the secretion of gastric juice. And this gastric juice contains three main components. It contains pepsinogen, it contains hydrochloric acid, and it contains renin. And then also we have goblet cells which are lining the stomach walls. They also secrete mucus, which performs two main functions, lubricating the food and also forming a protective barrier which prevents digestion of the walls of the glands by the proteases. What do you mean by proteases? Naming of enzymes. When you say a protease, a protease is an enzyme that digests a protein. So pro when you talk about proteases, we are simply talking about the enzymes which digest uh, proteins. Now, um, I wish to highlight something very critical at this particular point in time. Um, let me show this. Usually, we have a very serious problem when it comes to renin. Renin is an enzyme, but many times students like, like writing renin with a single N. And the funny thing that if the funny thing is if you write renin with a single N, it means a different thing altogether. That is a particular another enzyme that is found in kidneys in 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 in, in the in the in the in the renal system that regulates at, uh, arterial blood pressure. But the renin, which is an enzyme, must always be written with a double N as uh, projected on your screen. So the key thing again here at this particular point, candidates, is for you to understand these three components of the gastric juice, what are their roles in regard to, to digestion? That is the next important thing that we need to be able to, to highlight. Now, uh, let's look at the two aspects of digestion taking place in the stomach. One, there is physical digestion taking place in, in the stomach. Physical digestion, by now you, also, you remember, is where the food is further broken down into smaller particles without changing the chemical nature of the particle. So when food arrives in the stomach, the stomach walls will always contract and relax rhythmically, a process we are referring to as churning. And this breaks down the food further into smaller particles. And a semi-solid paste, which we are referring to as chime, is always formed. So at this particular point in time, candidates, it is essential to note, if a question is asking you, describe digestion in the stomach. A question of describe requires a brief explanation. So as a candidate, don't just say, when food arrives in the stomach, churning takes place. Uh, the term churning uh, is summative of the process. So it's important to you highlight that um, the stomach walls will, uh, the stomach wall muscles will contract and relax rhythmically. And this one contributes to further breakdown of the food substances into smaller food uh, particles. 
And we also see another, another, another common mistake with students here. Um, and this can come because at form one, you have not learned much about, uh, about the muscles. But we see sometimes when students say the stomach wall muscles contract and expand. Take note that muscles as tissues, they only contract and relax. They do not expand. They contract and relax. They don't expand. That's a very, very common mistake that you must always take care not to, not to make. Then you also have chemical digestion. And the chemical digestion that takes place here is as follows. The dichloric acid, which is secreted uh, uh, alongside or rather within the gastric juice, will activate pepsinogen to pepsin, which will then digest proteins to peptides and polypeptides. At the same time, that hydrochloric acid also, it activates proranin to renin, which then converts carcinogen to casein. So we have a number of processes that are taking place here. Now, we remember previously we said that amongst the components of uh, the digestive, uh, of the gastric juice, we said we have pepsinogen and we have proranin. Pepsinogen is the inactive form of the enzyme pepsin. Proranin is the inactive form of the enzyme renin. Now, this begs the question, why are these enzymes being secreted in their inactive forms? These ones are enzymes which are digesting proteins, remember. These are enzymes digesting proteins. And if you recall from chemicals of life, proteins make up structural compounds in our bodies. So the, the stomach walls, the gland walls, the glands which are secreting these enzymes, which are found within the stomach walls, the stomach walls are made up of proteins. And enzymes are not selective. They will not know that this protein here is from the, of the, the protein of the body, and that this protein here is the protein that is part of the food. So, there is need for us to protect the walls of the, uh, the, the walls of the glands from, from digestion by the proteases. So these enzymes will be secreted in a form that is inactive until they are released into the stomach where they, they, they come into contact with the proteins from the diet that has been taken in by an animal. What is the essence of this? This ensures that the walls of the glands which secrete these enzymes are not digested by these enzymes. The other way that also protects the digestive walls, um, that protects the glands from autodigestion or the walls of the stomach from autodigestion is the mucus barrier. The mucus that is being secreted by the goblet cells it forms a protective barrier that ensures that the proteases do not come into contact with the walls of the stomach to bring about auto-digestion. Auto-digestion means self-digestion. We don't want to have a case where the body is digesting itself. We don't want that to happen. We want the body to digest the food that has been ingested, not to digest itself. So, um, it's very essential that as candidates you understand the significance of secretion of these enzymes in their inactive states. The inactive states of these enzymes uh, is also referred to as precursor, precursor forms. So sometimes the question can be, give a reason why protein digesting enzymes are secreted in their inactive forms or give a reason why the protein digesting enzymes are secreted in their precursor forms. That is uh, one question. And uh, the reason we have said is to prevent autodigestion of the gland walls or of the stomach walls 
which are made up of proteins and uh, uh, the proteases which are part of the which are secreted in the gastric juice they can end up digesting uh, the walls of our bodies and we want we don't want that to to happen so take note that only chemical digestion of proteins occurs in the stomach digestion of starch does not take place in the stomach and what is the reason one can argue that digestion of starch does not take place in the stomach because there is no secretion of amylase in the stomach which is okay because there is no the, the only two enzymes being digested in the stomach are two uh, we have pepsin secreted in the form of pepsinogen we have renin secreted in the form of prorenin but remember that amylase was secreted in the stomach in, in, in the mouth and it was mixed with the food then the food was swallowed there is no sieve at the, at the mouth which ensures that the food is swallowed but the amylase, amylase enzyme is sieved and it remains in the stomach so this means when the amylase goes when the food is swallowed it is swallowed together with amylase that it was mixed with in this in the, in the mouth so we cannot say that there is no amylase in the stomach so the only reason why digestion of of uh, starch does not take place at the stomach is due to one of the factors that affects the activity of the enzymes which is ph in the mouth amylase digests starch to maltose because the ph there is slightly alkaline which favors the activity of the enzyme salivary amylase but when you go to the stomach there is secretion of hydrochloric acid the extreme acidity of the stomach becomes unfavorable for the enzyme amylase to digest starch if you remember when you're looking at the factors affecting activity of enzymes one of the factors we learned was that um, uh, extreme ph can denature the enzymes so hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid one of the effects it will do is that it will um, it will denature the enzyme amylase does stop in its activity in the in the stomach it is essential to take note of that i also wish to highlight something that is very critical for you to take note of here um under chemical digestion we are saying hydrochloric acid also activates chlorinin to renin which then converts carcinogen to casein and at this point in time i wish to um highlight this word very strongly and the word is converts renin as an enzyme does not it's a common mistake for some students when some some students say that renin digests carcinogen to casein renin does not digest carcinogen to casein but renin converts carcinogen to casein and i wanted to get the difference clearly here why are we uh, saying you don't say digest um majorly ren renin is an enzyme we predominantly find in higher concentrations in infants whose diet is predominantly milk and the protein carcinogen is largely found in milk and carcinogen is a soluble protein so if an infant was to take in milk in, the, in that liquid state that milk can very much easily uh, be passed down to the stomach and also passed down very quickly into the duodenum yet digestion of proteins needs to take place at the stomach so to avoid this the renin converts the soluble carcinogen to casein which is insoluble then now because the it's like the carcinogen becomes insolubilized it becomes it's made it's turned into an insoluble state 
in the stomach. Now it remains in the stomach for a longer period of time for the enzyme pepsin to digest the casein to peptides and polypeptides. So take note usually that uh, renin converts carcinogen to casein. Then once it has been converted to casein, the pepsin will then now act on the, uh, on the casein, digesting it to peptides and uh, polypeptides. This is very critical for you to take note of. So like, um, um, remember this, if you take milk today, if this is something maybe probably you have done at, one, at some point in time. If you haven't done it, you can do it today. Take a sin, take, take milk. Milk has got a protein inside that is um, insoluble. That is soluble, we are calling casinogen. If you take some drops of lemon and you add, you squeeze that into the milk, what happens? You find the milk curdles, the milk curds, it curds. It uh, forms uh, in quotes, like some sort of clots. So this is simply because of um, the, the carcinogen, which is soluble, being converted to casein, which is insoluble. And we have said this is significant for a reason. In infants, this ensures that now the carcinogen does not travel to the lower parts of the digestive system without being digested. So that this now provides room for the pepsin enzyme to now digest the casein to peptides and, uh, and polypeptides. Um, the hydrochloric acid also plays other significant roles in, 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 in the stomach, which you will come to, to learn of. But I want us to look at this illustration um, significantly. Um, this here illustrates the, uh, where we find uh, the gastric glands within these invaginations within the, uh, the walls of the stomach. So within these invaginations, this is where the gastric glands will secrete um, pepsinogen and proranine. And then now if they were to be secreted in the active forms of uh, pepsin and uh, particularly pepsin, what will be the effect? These walls are made up of protein. The pepsin will just start by will start digesting these proteins right away. And that is a situation you will not want to see happening, as I'm going to highlight later on. So within these points, the pepsin will be secreted in inactive form and it will be released into the stomach cavity. Once it is released into the stomach, that is when now the hydrochloric acid now activates it into the active form of pepsin, and then the pepsin now digests proteins to peptides and um, polypeptides. So what are the main functions? What are the main functions of hydrochloric acid in digestion in the stomach? Hydrochloric acid, number one, it creates the optimum pH for activity of uh, the enzyme pepsin and renin. Number two, it also activates pepsinogen to pepsin. And number three, it kills any bacteria that might have been ingested with food. This is another point where I have to highlight a very common mistake that students make. There's a common mistake where students say hydrochloric acid kills germs. I wish to uh, advise and discourage strongly against the use of the term germs when we're talking about the roles of uh, hydrochloric acid in this particular case. So summary of chemical digestion in the stomach can all be put in, in this statement here, in, in, in the illustration projected to you in your screen. Uh, proteins are being digested to pe polypeptides and peptides by pepsin. Then the soluble milk proteins, particularly the carcinogen is always converted to casein, which is an insoluble milk protein by renin, then the casein is further broken down into uh, polypeptides by pepsin. These are the main chemical digestive processes taking place in the stomach. But we have also said that in the stomach, 
uh, there is always a physical digestion of food. And the physical digestion of food in this case is brought about by the rhythmic contractions and relaxations of the muscles making up the walls of the stomach. When these muscles contract and relax, they contribute to further breakdown of the food into smaller particles. This is what we're referring to as channels. So if you were to describe digestion of food in the stomach, in a nutshell, what will you put forward? We have said that arrival of food in the stomach stimulates secretion of gastrin hormone. The gastrin hormone will further stimulate the secretion of gastric juice by the gastric glands you find in the walls of the, of the stomach. The gastric juice contains epsinogen, it contains chlorinine, and it contains hydrochloric acid. Then the hydrochloric acid will then activate pepsinogen to pepsin. It will also activate chlorinine to renin. Then the pepsin will then now digest proteins to polypeptides and peptides. Renin will convert carcinogen, a soluble milk protein, to casein, an insoluble milk protein. Then the pepsin will then now act on the casein, digesting it into polypeptides. We have said that these enzymes are secreted in their inactive forms. Why? To prevent auto-digestion to prevent digestion of the stomach walls by these enzymes. We have said it very critically. It is essential to talk of renin converting carcinogen to casein. Renin does not digest carcinogen to casein because there is no change in the chemical structure. We are simply converting it from one form to another. So it is not essentially a digestive uh, process. And then we can ask you to state two ways in which the, uh, the walls of the digestive system are protected against self-digestion. One, we have said is by the fact that the enzymes which are digesting proteins or the proteases, they are secreted in inactive forms. Number two, um, we also have the goblet cells along the digestive tract system. And these goblet cells, what do they do? These goblet cells, they secrete mucus. And the mucus also forms a protective barrier that is uh, preventing contact between the walls of the stomach or the walls of the digestive system and the proteases. And this one also um, ensures that the walls of the digestive system are protected against auto-digestion. Also, it's important to note that these digestive enzymes are only secreted upon arrival of food into the stomach. So this also protects against uh, auto-digestion. So let us review this quickly in a nutshell. What role does hydrochloric acid play in the stomach? We have highlighted the roles there. Take note of them. It has uh, four main roles that it plays there. But of course, there's another third role that it does play, which I can also add to this list, which is the fact that hydrochloric acid also initiates hydrolysis of food. It initiates hydrolysis of food. For example, sucrose, if present in, um, in the diet, in the food that has been consumed by an individual, hydrochloric acid will initiate the hydro, it will cause hydrolysis of the sucrose to glucose and, uh, and fructose. And at this particular point in time, also note, we have said critically that do not say that hydrochloric acid kills germs. It does not kill germs. It's not germs. It is talk of either pathogens or talk of bacteria that have been ingested by food, uh, together with the food. Then why is pepsin secreted as pepsinogen? We have talked about that one you need to be able to give the reason why that is happening. Then which cells secrete mucus in the stomach and always the importance of mucus in the stomach, you need to be able to give that. You can talk of two main reasons actually, uh, two main ways in which mucus is significant. One is lubrication of food, ensuring that it moves smoothly along the digestive system. 
But apart from that, it also uh, protects uh, the digestive uh, system walls against uh, auto digestion. And also another important question to ask is, why does digestion of starch stop in the stomach when food is swallowed? We have said in the stomach, there will be secretion of hydrochloric acid, which is uh, going to provide an unfavorable pH medium for activity of the enzymes saliva and lens. So this one will actually cause the maturation of uh, the salivary amylase enzyme that will therefore stop the activity of um, um, salivary amylase. Remember when an enzyme is denatured, it cannot now interact with the substrate molecules. It's like you, it's like a broken, a broken padlock. Remember enzymes lightly, uh, they were believed to be acting like a, a, a lock, lock and key. Try to have, imagine you have your, your padlock, which a particular key can open. What if someone comes and destroys that uh, part where you place the key? Now the key cannot enter, it means the door cannot be unlocked. So usually uh, when the active sites of enzymes are denatured, then it means these enzymes cannot interact with uh, the substrate molecules to catalyze the reactions. Uh, sometimes when there's secretion of little mucus in the stomach, we can have uh, conventional what are calling peptic ulcers. Uh, because remember you have said the mucus usually protects uh, the walls of the stomach against uh, auto-digestion. It prevents direct contact between the digestive enzymes and uh, the walls of the stomach. But if there's very little secretion of mucus, sometimes this protection is compromised. So now the digestive, the proteases can come into contact with the digestive walls. They end up digesting the walls of the stomach and that one can create very, very painful ulcers. But take note that not all ulcers are caused by uh, inadequate secretion of lipid mucus. We also have um, a bacteria that is responsible for secretion or that's responsible for uh, formation of uh, ulcers. My dear uh, students, that brings me to the end of the first session of uh, of uh, a digestion, uh, you will still need to learn and go through digestion in the duodenum and uh, digestion in uh, the ileum where digestion process ends. Uh, in a natural solo symbol, I'll repeat this, that is important that you know what happens, what digestive process has taken place in the mouth, what digestive processes take place in the stomach. You need to know the two aspects, the two types of digestion, that is physical and uh, chemical digestion. Remember, you are not lonely at home. You are very, very much safe at home. Maintain focus. COVID-19 will be beaten. The human race has emerged victorious over pandemics that have been so much worse than this. And it is another pandemic that will rise against. Uh, what is most important is right now is the time for you as a candidate to even double your preparation efforts and ensure that when all this is over, you are a better prepared candidate than when we moved into this pandemic. Till next time, bye.